So my name is Julian Thomas, and uh, I'm happy to be here at uh, Besides Budapest after being at Hacktivity. Um, so we'll talk on the subject called Inavitalization to Bypass Android Security Mechanism on not rooted devices. Uh, so this study is part of the uh, Protectoid project that uh, we are working on now for quite a couple of years. So um, it's quite a long talk that I will try to make short uh, because I have a lot of things to talk about. So I will quickly have an introduction about what's about. Then mention two core principles, which is what we call patching and what we call proxifying on Android, but like also the general term. Uh, and then a real consideration about how can that work in real life, because it's good to have theoretical point of view, but also like how can we make that work together to have something that really works uh, on real devices. And then, um, and after much kind of a review about that, what we can how we can deal with that, and a conclusion. So, uh, the objective of this talk, as I said, is to talk about um, patching and proxifying and the limitation of Android security caused by that. And uh, what's important when we talk about security is good to have good security, but it's also good to have, to show that in a good way so that we cannot play with limitation of user knowledge and user perception to trick them, even if the system is secure, it should not be hap it should not be possible to do it, but if you can do it in a way that users don't understand, well, they will agree, and then you will be able to do what you want. So it was the first thing. And the second thing is that we will have another perspective, because here again, when we talk about patching of memory in Android, well, most of the time, you, you consider like you have root access, you proxify libs into processes, well, it's good to also be on the other side, which means like you're only an app. You're an attacker, you're an app. So you have basically no capability on the system. You don't want to be detected because if you're detected, then you get removed. And well, what can you do when you're under such circumstances? So as I said, this is part of the uh, Protectoid project. And what I always like to, to mention when I have a talk is like, where does that come from? So in activity, I said that we, it's come from an undecidability to decide about the uh, application that tried to connect to internet that we started the whole project. Well, now it's like we had another issue, which is how does application hide, hide other applications? I mean, there's quite a, a lot of applications pretend or do that, but how does it work? Because it's normally not that possible. So uh, before talking about like memory, writing, patching, and proxifying, I was just curious about two general questions for the audience. It's like, who knows about uh, memory patching method uh, address patching on Android? Nobody heard about that? OK. Uh, so I'll try to explain that. And the second question, because I'm talking about the second subject too, which is, um, proxification or what we call in-app virtualization. So virtualization on Android, like um, plugins on Android, does that ring a bell to someone? Okay. So uh, when I say memory writing, uh, we have to consider three type of, of code. So we have the native code because on Android we can have nat native libraries inside application, so it's executed. Then you have the call that is pre-compiled or compiled depending on the version of Android you are working on. So what we call JIT or ahead of time compilation. Then at some point, other part of Java code is sometimes compiled or not. Okay, and all of this execution flow in, is set in memory through what we call ART uh, structure. ART stands for Android Runtime. So when we talk about Java methods, uh, mainly the virtual one, which is kind of the public methods, uh, well, what we can do about them is that if we're an application, we can self-patch, I meaning like we can rewrite your own uh, memory, we can override uh, DAX, um, and we can also play with what we call, and what I will explain through virtualization, subloaded applications. We can play with the memory of applications that we launch within our own um, context. And obviously, all of that is due at the C level, so through uh, GNE bridges, um, to be able to control that on Java level. So if we look very quickly about the uh, workflow, so that's a little redesign, but that's the Android documentation, what we have here is that we have the code that is RLT mapped, and then it's executed. So depending on the version, we have on Android, either it's AOT or a GIT, and if it's none of them, then we try to 
we try to run it, to interpret it, and if we can compile what well, we will compile it. So basically, we do quite a lot of things. But what's interesting is here, is that here, basically, we, we try to put some things in memories, in memory, sorry, and that's where, that's where we can play. So before explaining everything, I mean, I'm, I will try to do the demo if I can uh, show it, because it's still interesting, I believe is that, let's say we have this environment, so we have an application that do four type of connection, one which is pure HTTP, one that does HTTPS, like raw HTTPS without any security consideration, we just do HTTPS connection. Then, which is HTTPS connection with a custom trusted manager, so like we'll restrict the, cer the set of certificates that we consider as being trusted. And the last one, which is like we do HTTPS connection with a, a, a sub-restricted set of trustworthy certificates and a custom libraries to do the HTTP. And uh, obviously, as I said, your device is not rooted. This hub that I mentioned is safe, like it doesn't have a bad be behavior in itself. And you install what I would say a nice, I mean, it's not that nice, but it's, it's nice, uh, launcher application that you call launcher. So we have a lot of instances on the, on the Play Store. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not um, like a random idea. Like you have desktop launcher, you have privacy vaults that do exactly that as a purpose, like they launch other applications. And the question is that, okay, what can be done? I mean, like, in theory, nothing. Like, I mean, like we cannot break the HTTPS um, process. Well, in fact, that's not really true. I mean, like, obviously, you can easily um, monitor HTTP connection. I mean, it's HTTP. Uh, you can, b um, like, destroy the um, default implementation of HTTPS to spy on HTTPS uh, traffic of this application. What you can also do is by combining both the authorization and patching, where well, you can also unset the trusted manager settings on Android. And basically, you will say that, no, trust my certificate, even if it's not a good one. The last one, which we are still not able to do, but we're working on, is to bypass custom HTTP libraries. So if these custom HTTP libraries rely on, on underlying, I mean, uh, on, on Android and on Java, well, that's easy to do. But like, if it's really standalone li library, and I will explain why, we're still not able to um, bypass the security. So I wanted to show a demo. Uh, I will try to load that from the web and hope it works. Uh, I mean, normally I have that on my key, but not, not is working here. So like basically here we have an application that does f this full connection type, uh, pure HTTP, pure, uh, pure HTTPS, HTTPS with trusted manager, and um, custom HTTPS through, uh, if I remember correctly, it's OK HTTP library, so it's not system uh, loaded, okay? So if we do the connection, like default connection, everything works, that's normal, like, like nothing is proxified, okay? So like we will relaunch this application and try to um, proxify the um, HTTP and HTTPS connection uh, so that we monitor them. Obviously, by default, well, there is no way it should work. I mean, like, we cannot have a man-in-the-middle proxy with, like, a custom HTTPS um, certificate that try to listen on, on you. I mean, like, that's, that's not possible. So I will have to say on that one, trust me, because I don't want to waste, but basically that, that does not work. I mean, like, uh, it's kind of pointless to say, to show something that does not work. Like, I mean, like, we, you cannot spy on HTTPS traffic. And uh, if that loads, okay, so anyway, uh, I will make the demo available. <laughs> so if you want to look at that one later. Anyway, the explanation uh, will show that why and how uh, it works. Okay, so sorry for that, but basically the idea is that you can build an, um, a proxy, so it can be local, it can be on the web, wherever you want, and you can spy on HTTPS traffic that is either relying on default Android set, uh, Java settings or with uh, the Android Trusted Manager restriction. Um, so sorry for the demo, I will, I will make it available. So, uh, core principle of patching. So, uh, as I say, very important distinction before and after uh, ahead of time compilation. So, like basically before and, and since KitKat or since Lollipop. Uh, so, what we had before is that we have the Dalvik, which is kind of the GVM from Android, so Java Virtual Machine, with what we do, what we say, sorry, just in time compilation. So, it's not pre compiled. Um, then we have since that 
ART, so with ahead of time. So basically, when you install an app on a device, it's pre-compiled um, to improve performances. However, even if that's just an implementation distinction, the underlying structure remains the same. Okay. So if we look quickly at Dalvik structure, so we have here what we call the class object. So what's important on this class object, we have a lot of data here, it's not really important. Then we have the method. And also here, for example, we have the pointer to the table of, of virtual methods and the pointer to what we call the virtual table that is used to basically jump to the uh, address of the um, method. And here on the method, we have what we call the method index and the class. So basically, when you call a method, it will look for the class, it will look for the index, and it will jump at the correct index of what we call the vtable to get the address of the method to launch. So if you want to patch that, it's kind of very easy because like uh, I put here um, a mention of a blog post where you have everything very well described, like it's nearly like there. I mean, like you just have to use library that is available to, to patch it. You just have to be careful about how you do that. But basically, you just have to say, find class, find uh, new class, find old class, then jump to the, um, sorry, then get the new method address, and then put this new method address inside the uh, class that you want to patch, uh, correct the table uh, entry. If we look at uh, since Lollipop, so not that big, but like pre-compiled, well, we can say that all. Well, it's very f interesting. We have the same thing: vtable, virtual methods, method index, and like it's really similar. I mean, as I say, it's quite uh, normal because the logic is the same. What we try to improve with uh, what they try so to improve with this ahead of, ahead of time compilation is not reviewing the logic, but it's improving the performances. So the logic is the same. Uh, so. Obviously, the Dalvik um, virtual machine is not there anymore for just-in-time compilation, so we cannot use on, on the previous mentioned uh, method. However, we have new methods now available, um, which in fact do nearly the same thing. So we just have to switch the code, but the implementation, the underlying patching logic is again the same, so which is very interesting because it's kind of easy to make um, a multi-Android version compatible patching uh, framework. So that's why I try here to, to summarize that basically if we just abstract the, the exact implementation where we have a class, a method, we look for the class, then we go to the, um, what we call here the vtable to just up, get the new address, and then that's how the execution flow number one works. Well, if you want to just patch it, we just have to basically just overwrite here the pointer to say, no, 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 the pointer is here then you have to do the correct implementation depending on the Android version, but the logic is here. You just have to like basically change two pointers in the memory to be able to patch. Uh, a little distinction is that, as I will show later, it's not that he's easy because basically when with IRT and Android, um, so since Lollipop, like when, when to move to new version of Android, they, they have this nice idea to also move the uh, implementation of the um, ART structures one of the examples is to move to 64 bytes instead of 32. Well, obviously that impacts us in the way which, where are the uh, index and the structure we want to, to modify. Um, so what's the patching objective? I mean, like, when, what, what do we want to patch like that? I mean, like, what, what we want to patch our memory? I mean, like, it's not, not a lot of things. Well, you can just change very few stuff. You can change the execution flow. So basically, if you want to have someone that type on the text, well, it can be also automatically copy to the clipboard for easy um, saving wherever else. So it's, it's nice, but like the real usage are, are limited, except maybe if you want to uh, misbehave the user perception, but it's not that much. And the source code I mentioned above and the link I put, like it's, we have already quite a, a good set of libraries that does that whether it's invasive or non-invasive um, approach, uh, you can already patch quite easily with these libraries um, the memory of Android. Okay? But the issue is that here it's basically viewed as a security tool point of view because nearly all of the time you need to have a, a rooted device or even need to have new frameworks or exposed or whatever framework. So that's not what we want to do. We, want to do like we don't want to be rooted. We want to be a, like a basic application, so that's not good for us. 
And here come the second aspect of, of this presentation, which is what we call in-app virtualization or proxifying. Uh, I don't want to plan the game, so I, I mentioned both. Um, so if we have dynamic code loading, so what we say is that we can basically put a DEX file, so like a, a separate DEX file, uh, on an application and put that in memory after the application launch. So that's why we call dynamic code loading, so you can, I don't know, dynamically load Java methods and, and execution. So it's used most of the time by my words. Um, I will not say most of the time, some of the time. And it's also used to dynamically load code. So like we have multiple purposes to do dynamic code loading. Like if you want to patch an existing application without following the uh, update mechanism of Android. I mean, that's not, it's not permitted, but you can do that. Uh, if you want to launch frameworks that is user specific. So you have not always bad intention with dynamic code loading, and that's, that's maybe the problem. Otherwise, it would have been easy, like you just like block dynamic code loading and, and promise soft. Uh, but no, because this is used by a lot of genuine applications. So you cannot do that. And uh, I think that you can also look at two very interesting studies, which is like one of the Semantech reports, which is that in fact, most of the time, the implementation of dynamic code loading misunderstand how it works on Android and like it's subject to a lot of vulnerabilities. So if your applications that do that, well just do not trust them that much. So uh, here it's good, we can load code, but it's not mean virtualizing application. I mean like that's a step above if you want to really virtualize application. When you want to virtualize uh, application, what you want to do is like you want to start a new application that the user sees that as a new application, not as a feature, not as a button click. No, no. What you want is have these applications that behave like it was normally launched. So basically what you want to do is to launch the application, to do thread attachment, to launch threads, and to preserve all the Android workflow that comes with the execution of an application. So when you launch the application, it's create a new process, then it threads that, then it's, if there are services, it's new services, for it's new processes, sorry, for the services, you have user ID. And uh, well, you have libraries that, work, that deal with all of that. And it's very cool libraries. Um, so before mentioning that, I, I just wanted to mention some terminology about proxifier versus proxified. Uh, because I use that as shortcut later on. So the proxifier is kind of the host hub that is doing the proxification, and the proxified is the hosted hub that is being proxified by the um, proxifier. And we have here uh, maybe four, uh, two important concepts, which is virtual activity and the virtual service, which in fact are activities, so normal activities, but launched under the control of the uh, proxifier, and the same thing for the services. Okay, so what's the objective of virtualization? Because here again, if we, it would have been obvious that the intent was malicious, why well, it would have been blocked or, or somehow discredited. Well, you have a lot of applications that do uh, proxifying for, let's say, genuine reason. One is that you want to vault apps and hide them from the system or from other users. Basically, when you launch the Android, if you vault apps within these proxifiers, nobody sees them. Nobody can run them if the vault is password protected. Uh, you can also what we call multi-instantiation approach. So that's maybe one of the main objectives, both privacy and multi-instantiation. If you have an app that does not support multi-instantiation, I think Twitter does that now, but before it does implement multi-account, uh, well, you just have to multiple time virtualize Twitter within this proxy file to be able to have multiple instances of, of, of Twitter within your own Android. I mean, like, uh, it's not a joke, like, people do that. Um, I mean, one interesting stuff is that, well, when you start to do that, you know that you are totally outside of standard execution scopes, meaning like updates, not managed. Security of the execution of this application, I mean, nearly virtually zero. Um, so I think it's quite of interesting that by simply proxifying, you can do all of that. You have all these disadvantages and nobody really um, understands that because of user misperception. Okay. So how proxifying works? I mean, I put some gray here. I mean, it's very easy to know which li library I'm mentioning, uh, but I don't want to be the one that discloses this name, so I prefer not to. So basically, uh, what you do is that, well, you just have to handle here this one and try to mention is that here, what you do is that you need a new process through what we call a virtual activity manager, because normally you cannot do that. I mean, like there is no way you can launch a process on Android that is an application. That's normally that's, that's the goal of the uh, Android system and the, um, oh, 
got the name of this uh, demon that handled that. But anyway, so it's not possible. So you virtualize the execution of a new process. And, and you virtualize the launch of this application. All of that happened under the control of the proxy fire. Okay, and, and to be able to do that, what you describe in your manifest on, of the proxy fire is that to describe new activities here that have this very specific process attribute that says, no, no, when you put this activity that is dynamically loaded, don't put that in my process. Put that in a new process. And basically, we have the main activity of a new application that is launched in a new process, which is what we want to preserve normal execution. And if we look here at the um, process status, what we see is that here I made this, uh, this networking application, which is an application I wanted to show in the demo, that is virtualized, and you will see that they share here the same user ID as the uh, proxy fire. I mean, they have new process ID, which is what we want, but they have the same user ID, which means that they are being proxified. Okay, uh, so how proxifying works, step three. Uh, so you virtualize user ID of the application. So even you can have multiple uh, user enable to have multiple user ID based on the application ID. So you, you do whatever you want, basically. And uh, real state is preserved, as I said, because when you do system calls, like if you have the ID 10003, for example, for the third application that is being virtualized, well, you cannot say that to the system because it does not exist as a user ID or it's even a system ID. So you have to say, no, when you want to do a system call, just use the uh, proxy fire user ID, which is the one that the system sees and know. Okay, so virtualization explained, patching explained. Uh, well, how does it work together? So why uh, doing both together? Why simply not doing proxy fine because it's quite a, a lot of good feature ready for us. So um, if we do not do patching, we we'll just proxy fine and see what we can do from that. Um, so first, a feature that is very interesting is that the normal execution is preserved. So basically, you don't have detectable payload, like it's not a payload that is added to the uh, proxy fire, like you can just take an application that is on the system, proxy fire it out of the box and run in, run it, sorry, and uh, well, it's here, proxy fired, no code loaded from anywhere on the web. It's just like loaded from the system itself on another folder because it's available for everyone. And you can also have what we call Byzantine approach, meaning like if you want to not be detected, you just can trigger the virtualization on demand. And you can also what uh, do is trigger user-specific decision, meaning here again, when you have a virus, it's easy to spot that it's a virus because I've been doing a lot of malicious activities on a lot of other applications. When if you have a Byzantine approach and a user-specific approach, it starts to be more difficult to, spy, uh, to, to spot them. So if you do that still only proxification, you have a lot of things to do on the proxifier side. You have to implement two main things, which you have to implement what I call the set of permission from all the hosted apps, because the system sees a proxifier, not the proxified. So if a proxified application wants to access contact, if the proxifier do not have access to contact, it will not work. So you have two approach. Most of the time, what, they, what the proxifier do is that they request everything that uh, proxified apps could have. Uh, it's easy to spot them. So you can what say is that, oh, you just implement, for example, contact access because it's what you want, and you deny any other permission as uh, requested by the proxified because you control them. And you have to do another thing, which is bridging five system for hosting hosted apps, sorry. Because on Android, um, each app has its own private directory that is controlled by, uh, by normal Linux um, permissions. So you just have to bridge this um, private directory to the private directory of the proxy fire. If you do that, well, an app will work and run. A proxy file app will run nearly out of the box, and uh, you control the file system. So what you do here is that, as I said, you bridge the file system on the private directory of the proxy fire. So basically, you use the user ID of the proxy fire. So you see, control can delete, can read all the private data of the proxy file apps. Another thing that is fun is that, well, you can also preset uh, the default environment settings. So as I said before, you can, for example, bypass the HTTPS default configuration uh, on Android, um, and you can bypass also the um, proxy, sorry, default configuration to say that before or after I launch this new activity in its in own process, well, just preset the um, HTTP proxy environment on Java side, so system. 
uh, just preset uh, the default trusted certificate manager. So basically, you can say, oh, redirect to an unknown, um, I will not mention country, so to IP1111, and trusted certificate trust everything on the world. And basically, all your traffic may say be HTTPS be, will be redirected to the uh, man in the middle proxy, 111, and as we trust any certificate, even invalid one, well, it will work. Uh, so that's what here I mentioned, is that here, if you just put here this set property on the system, so the proxy host and the proxy port, well, you redirect all the traffic of these hosted apps to this specific address um, by default, like you have nothing to do. Um, and here, if you preset the HTTPS configuration to the set default SSF socket factory of the hosted process, well, you say, uh, basically, here, uh, that, yeah, is it, a va a very, is it a valid host name? Yes, true. And here, uh, do I trust the certificate? Yes, trust everything. Well, you, you can access all of that. Okay, so patching from scratch. There's a question, can we patch from scratch? Uh, yeah, we can patch from scratch. I mean, uh, I tried to patch from scratch, that was fun. Uh, I think it's important to patch from scratch and not use libraries because that's where you understand the distinction between Dalvik and ART. You understand the distinction between each version of ART and you understand what you can and cannot do. Because if you use libraries, you will be very quickly limited about the understanding of what you can do. Um, there are a lot of work on, uh, on Dalvik. Far less surprisingly on ART, uh, even if I would believe that it's far easier to do. And yes, yeah, as I mentioned, I think like wh when you do Java for a long time, you're quite pissed off not being able to uh, patch memory. So I think it was very funny to patch from scratch to be able to GNI bridge, uh, GNI bridge, sorry, um, memory patching. I mean, like, that was just for myself quite fun. Um, so, okay, easy, but uh, in fact, not that easy. Easy to waste a lot of hours. Yes, yeah, that's super easy to waste hours. Uh, because of incorrect documentation, it's easy to waste hours because, well, if you do not pay attention that this map from 32 bytes to, four, to 64 bytes on the new version of Android, well, surprisingly, you jump in the middle of, of addresses, which is kind of doing sec fault and not good. And what you need to know also is, in fact, what do you want to patch? What do you want to patch? What do you want to patch? I mean, like, like you have a lot of, the structure is not that easy. You want to patch the um, V table memory, but you also have what we call the EF table. You also have the static methods. Can you patch static methods? Can you not patch static methods? You know, wh which DAX do you want to override? I mean, like you have the DAX from the system, and you have the DAX from the proxy for the apps. I mean, like, wh what do you want really to do? So I will explain later what do you want to do, but like I think that just patching from scratch is very good because like it's raised all of these kind of questions, then you understand better what you do. And uh, as I say, uh, patching from scratch is very complicated and boring because uh, when you move to from lollipop to marshmallow, well, you move to 64, you unsigned in instead of 32, but that's the structure and the pointer inside the structure are still unsigned in 32. So like it's kind of fun to, to, to think about that. Uh, so the question is like, yeah, I mean, is it really an option to proxy from scratch and not using simple li libraries? Okay. Uh, because if you, if you see like this kind of codes, uh, if you want to proxy from scratch, where well, you do this kind of methods, like if you don't understand why it's sec faulting, you start to print uh, the memories to look at the index. Yes, it's a good index. Yes, this index is good because here I see that on the index 24 of the uh, structure, I have four, which is the uh, index of my method. So here that's checked, that's good. And uh, here, yeah, if I jump at the end, uh, yeah, I still see this four. Uh, so yes, I'm patching the correct method. So that's what you have to, to, to look at. Then the second question is that proxifying correctly. Yeah, it's easy to proxify, as I said, just use a proxifying tool. And, but where, if you want to proxify and patch, where, where do you proxify? How do you proxify? When do you proxify? I see a lot of questions. And uh, what we wanted to do first is to um, make a library that is capable of proxifying, you know, within a correct application. And uh, what we reach here is, um, I mean, that's a word description of the uh, project, which is like you have a front-end launcher that is basically relying on the back-end for management, so that's, that's uh, an open source launcher. Uh, and when you can say that you can decide, do I want, yes, or no, to virtualize this application. As I said, it can be on the user's discretion so that you are less easy detectable. Okay, so then you try to proxify it. If you do not succeed, you want to preserve because sometimes the proxifying library fails. I mean, like there are a lot of reasons for the failing, so you don't want the users to see that. So well, you just redirect to the normal execution flow, not proxified. And if you succeed to proxify, well, you start to patch. 
Okay, and if, if again, if you fail to patch, you can decide what you want to do. Do you want to stop the proxification and restart the activity out on its own uh, context or not? Okay. And if you do that, we'll start to have a quite very good silent patching project. Uh, so, I mentioned proxy finding only is already good, like you can do quite a lot of things, preset default settings, access local storage. What's the point of proxy finding and patching? Because patching is not that uh, straightforward. Well, you can obviously do everything as you can with proxy finding if you do both. And you can also do something very fun, which is you can start to patch all the calls. So, like, you, if, you, if some, for example, if you want to check, do I have permission? Well, you just patch permission check. So you said, yes, permission granted. So basically, if you have custom permissions that are set on the hosted apps, you can just bypass all the checks through the um, patching. And you can lie about e EPCs too, but I can mention that uh, outside of this presentation. So the question is that, yeah, is that easy? We have the proxy fine library, we have the patching library, we just put it together and it works. So, yeah. Well, not really, because as I said, you first want to know where to patch. You know, like for example, when you have a patching library, they do not do virtualization, so they have two decks, they play with two decks. Well, we don't want to do that, because as we virtualize, what we want to do is to play with the system decks. So what we will do is that the patching will just go on the system deck, look of the hooked, I mean like the main method you want to hook, we get the new method that you want to be the hooking point, and put that together, ready your exam, and make it work on the uh, proxified process. Which version of Android also is targeted is very important. Which method you want to use is important because, for example, if you use a hard hook project which is in C, it works on KitKat and Lollipop, it doesn't work above. If you use Android, it's supposed to work on all, but you have an issue that is C code which fails to work with the proxifying library. So, in fact, you end up with a very specific need. Uh, like, if you want to do, be able to virtualize within a normal, within a normal launcher, and also patch where well, it starts to be complicated to re rely on libraries because you start to have a lot of conflict between them. Okay. So here, the, the conclusion is that patching from scratch was very good because you can control whatever you want. So you just don't care about the proxification because it's too complicated to do on your own. You have too much things to do. Well, you can, cost, I mean, you can patch the proxifier, uh, but you cannot pro really redo proxifying from scratch, but you can do a patching from scratch. Because even if that's complicated at the beginning, at the end you have a con total control about the patching technique, which is really the most um, versatile part of the process because you have to be Android um, version compliant, dependent, user decision specific, so that's where all the decision is very customized. So that's why here, uh, maybe I was too fast, yeah. So I don't know like, if you can see that, but basically what you say is that you load uh, the virtual method, then you try to say what kind of virtual method is that. If it's a virtual method where you patch it, it's nearly out of the scope, I mean out of the scratch. If it's a static method, you can try to patch it, but if it's static native, it's not possible. So like, not all the methods are really easily patchable, or some of them are not even patchable at all. So you have to try and see if it fails or not, because sometimes even the V table is, not, is empty, it's null pointer. So in that case, you cannot patch it, and you have to be very uh, sensitive because if you fail to deal with that correctly, well, the, the application crashes directly, like, like it's a sec fault, a GNI, GNI exception, like that's a total disaster because you get uh, detected uh, directly. So what happened at the end is that you have a very nice application that is being launched, being virtualized, is your virtualization phase where it's normal execution, then you start to patch, if you, at the end of the patching, you can decide either the patching is correct or not, if it's not correct, you can redirect to the normal execution so that users don't see it, or even if you succeed to proxify and patch, well, you still keep that because that's very good, then that's a win for you. So, um, detection method because that's not good, so can we detect that behavior? So you have basically two point of view to approach for that. One which is as a security app or as a system app, can you try to detect them, okay? So can you try to detect my web by signature? Can you try my web by library signature? Well, here we are on the antivirus and the well-known complication to deal with the evolution of the malware size signature, so it's not really an option. Uh, then within the app, can you do some things? Can you try to prevent an app from being virtualized? Now, that was a topic presented at the Black Hat conference last year uh, um, in Asia called Plugin Color which they try to det detect, sorry, um, leak data from the virtualization that can tell you that it has been virtualized, okay? Uh, I will mention that later. 
then what? I mean, like, after you detect this virtualization, what do you do? You block the app, you ask for user consent, like nobody really agreed on that, because if you ask the user consent, do you want this application to virtualize? I mean, they will say yes, even if they don't understand what it means. Okay, how to avoid detection? Because as I said, I tried to get on the, not on the good side, but on the bad side, like we're trying to build a malware platform, so how can we prevent to be detected? Uh, first, if you're within the app, I mean, like what's cool is that the um, security feature is within the app that you already virtualized. So, I mean, like the plugin is virtualized. So, you can already first try to disable the plugin. If you fail to disable the plugin, can you try to prevent the detection? Because the detection relies on virtualizable methods on, or virtualized methods. And here, basically, you start to be kind of the virtualization game that, you know, when you have an hypervisor that try to analyze virus uh, and another scope of virus analysis, where you try to make virtualizer as stiff as possible so that the virus does not pr prevent its ex execution. Well, we are on the same side now, except that the hypervisor is a proxy fire, so it's a virus. So if the virus succeed to, to not leak any virtualization data, well, the application will not see it. You know, like, for example, you try to hide how many activity you have, you try to hide the process ID, you try to hide the user ID, and basically the application will not know it's virtualized. Okay, uh, what you can try to do is minimizing the, minimizing, sorry, the virtualization library footprint. So by being only G, GNI bridge for most of the work, it's very hard to be uh, detected. And uh, as I said, you can try to minima minimize the virtualization footer by rebridging the uh, app private folder. So that, for example, if you are a virtualized app and ask what is my folder, by default, it will say that your folder is slash data, slash data, slash proxifier, slash zero, slash data, slash data, slash proxified, which is not really the, the one that you expect. So you will kill the application if you, if you want to secure it. But you can lie about that. I mean, like as I said, you are on the proxifier side, so if you lie about that correctly, well, the application will believe that it's on slash data, slash data, slash proxified, even if it's not. Okay, um, some issues we still have. Time loading is a very big issue when you do virtualization. Unless you're on a very good uh, device, it slows down uh, the execution flow. So we can try to solve that by preloading the virtualized app. Uh, you have a lot of data to proxify. I mean, like, really a lot if you want to hide your, f your, s your footprint. You have to hide the proxify definition, the proxify light definition. Like, like, you have to hide and play a lot with that. And uh, uh, sometimes even the virtualization data are leaked, for example, that Matching is not a one hundred percent well done on the uh, proxy file libraries, and you will be you will have requests sorry, that are redirected to the system without being reproxified, and here start to be visible to the uh, proxy file app, so we can detect, which is not good. So quite a lot to do. How to avoid detection method system level, because I, I mentioned before the application level. So at system level, I mean we can start to first like first we have to make virtualization obvious. You are a privacy app. You are, I don't know, a multi-instantiation app. So it's justified. You're not hiding the justification of virtualization. And then you are user-specific. By being user-specific is very good because you can minimize the number of, of processed activity on your definition. You can minimize the number of permissions that you request. So it will like you very hard to be detected as a footprint, for example, on the manifest definition. Okay, so we'd be worried. Uh, I took like a sample of 15K application on eight stores and tried to count uh, what we have. Uh, we see that we already have quite, i say here, 0.2% of the application on the market that start to be very surprising. I mean, like, who ask 91 permission? I mean, like, why do you need one 91 permission as a normal execution? I mean, like, there is one that is very funny, like it has 437 permission. Well, I mean, don't, don't install this app. Uh, and then you start to see how many activities does this app pretend to have. I mean, like one app, very funny here again, like 1,215, uh, 16, sorry, activities. I mean, like for a very small app, that's kind of start to be very suspicious, okay? And here again, you see what? More than 5%, like if you combine together, 3% of the uh, application available on the market have more than 120 uh, process activity. I mean, like that, starts, that should start to uh, ring a bell. Like, why do you need 120 proxified activities? I mean, one need maybe it's like it's an antivirus that process that proxified. Sorry, uh, no, process the analysis of the other application. Yeah, 
I think that this uh, antivirus has 140 act process activity. But apart from that, why would you need that many process? I mean, like separated process activities, like normally in, it's not used. Like I didn't mention, but like I think that 95% of the application do not have process activity. Well, I just mentioned here the one that has process activity. Okay, conclusion. Uh, patching is complex. Yeah, it's interesting, but complex. You have to see which method you can hook, how you can hook them, why you cannot hook other methods. I mean, I didn't mention, for example, why you cannot hook from the DAX of the proxy file app. You have the issue with what we call the uh, JIT execution, the ahead of time execution for these subloading applications. You, can, you cannot. Uh, but we're still working on that. Uh, proxy files open uh, up new opportunities, really kind of a lot of new opportunities. And uh, a lot, as I said, a lot of potential works exist. How we can stabilize the hooking framework to event crashing to support new methods very well. Uh, how we can stabilize detection avoidance framework to be like uh, minimize really like nearly to zero the uh, virtualization footprint. I mean, like nobody else does that. You just have to look how many process activity you have. If you grab under the APK libdex, I mean, you will find them that they don't even hide the name. Um, but if you hide that, well, it's, you will start to have a very good uh, solution. As I mentioned, so this work was, as I said, was made through Protectoid. We're always open to new survey ideas. So we're working on, on proxifying and, and patching on the community side. If you have an, any other idea for Android, we're always welcome to, to work on, on new ideas. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>